So I left off uh, on page 46 of chapter two for everything I never told you. And I wanted to make sure that I finished this chapter and it's not super long, so it should only take us a few minutes. So if you are following along with me and you want us to continue reading everything I never told you, just drop me a line in the comment section and we will keep doing that. Um, if you have tiny humans that enjoy the reading being read to as well, um, I also have a kid's corner where we are reading a bunch of lovely children's books. So let me know if you have any requests there as well, or if you'd like us to read something else. And hopefully in January, we can get back to doing our first chapter Friday. So here we are on everything I never told you. Chapter two, part two, because I ran out of time last time. You ready? He began to make salt small changes as he thought she might like. He trimmed his hair. He brought a blue striped Oxford shirt after she admired one on a passerby. The cowlick, persistent, still stood up years later. Nath and Hannah would inherit it too. One Saturday, at Marilyn's suggestion, he bought two gowns of pale yellow paint, brushed, pushed the furniture to the middle of the apartment, and spread drop cloths across the park heap. As they brushed one section, then another, the room brightened like panes of sunlight stretching across the walls. When everything was painted, they opened all the windows and curled up into the bed in the center of the room. The apartment was so small that nothing was more than a few feet from the wall, but surrounded by his desk and chairs and armchair and the dresser pressed close, he felt as if they were on an island or afloat in the sea. When Marilyn tucked in the curve of his shoulder, he kissed her and his arms circled her, her arm circled his neck. Her body rose to meet his. Another tiny miracle every time. Later that afternoon, walking into the fading light, he noticed a tiny yellow blotch on the tip of Marilyn's nose. After a moment of searching, he found the smudge on the wall near the end of the bed where her foot... Oh, that says on the tip of Marilyn's toe. Sorry. Where her foot had touched it as they'd made love, a dime-sized spot where the paint was blotted away. He said nothing to Marilyn, and when they pushed the furniture back into place that evening, the dresser concealed the smudge. Every time he looked at the dresser, he was pleased, as if he could see through the pine drawers and his folded clothing straight to it, the mark her body left in his space. At Thanksgiving, Marilyn decided not to go home to Virginia. She told herself and Jane's it was too far for such a short holiday, but really, she knew that her mother would ask her again if she had any prospects, and this time, she did not know how to respond. Instead, in James' tiny kitchen, she roasted chicken, soup, potatoes, peeled yams into a casserole dish the size of a steno pan. Thanksgiving dinner, in miniature, James, who had never cooked himself a meal, who subsisted on burgers from Charlie's Kitchen and English muffins from the Hayes Brickford, watched in awe. After Marilyn basted the chicken, she looked up defiantly, closed the oven, and peeled the elements from her hand. My mother is a home economics teacher, she said. Betty Crocker is her personal goddess. It was the first thing she had told him about her mother. The way she had said it, it sounded like a secret, something she had kept hidden now deliberately, trusting, revealed. James felt he should return this privilege, this private gift. He had mentioned once in passing that his parents had worked at a school, leaving it at that, hoping she'd think teacher. But he had never told her how the school kitchen had been like the land of the giants, everything economy-sized, Rolls of tinfoil half a mile long, jars of mayonnaise big enough to hold his head. His mother was in charge of bringing the world down to scale, chopping melons into dice-sized cubes, portioning pats of butter onto saucers to accompany each roll. He had never told anyone how the other kitchen ladies snickered at his mother for wrapping up the leftover food instead of throwing it away. How at home they'd reheat the oven, it in the oven, while his parents quizzed him, what did you do in geography? What did you do in math? And he'd recite, Montgomery is the capital of Alabama. Prime numbers have only two factors. They don't understand his answers, but they nodded, pleased that he could crumble crackers into a cup of celery. Pleased that James was learning things they did not know. As they spoke, he would crumble crackers into a cup of celery soup or peel wax paper from a wedge of cheese sandwich and pause, confused. Certain he'd done this before, uncertain whether he was reviewing his studies or the whole school day. In the fifth grade, he stopped speaking Chinese to his parents, afraid of tinting his English with an accent. Long before that, he had stopped speaking to his parents at school at all. He was afraid to tell Marilyn these things, afraid that once he afraid that once he admitted them, that she would see him as he had always seen himself, a scrawny outcast. 
feeding on scraps, reciting his lines and trying to pass, an imposter. He was afraid she would never see him in any other way. My parents are both dead, he said. They died just after I started college. His mother had died his second year, a tumor blossoming in her brain. His father had gone six months later, complications of pneumonia, the doctor had said, but James had known the truth. His father simply hadn't wanted to live alone. Marilyn didn't say anything, but she reached out and cupped his face in her hands, and James felt the leftover heat from the oven on her soft palms. They were there only a moment before the timer buzzed and she turned back to the stove, but they were warm, but they warmed him through. He remembered his mother's hands, scarred from steam burns, callous from scouring pots, and wanted to press his lips to the tender hollow there where Marilyn's lifeline and love line crossed. He promised himself he would never let those hands harden. As Marilyn took the chicken, burnished and bronze from the oven, he was mesmerized by her deftness. It was beautiful, the way broth thickened to gravy under her guidance, how potatoes fluffed like cotton beneath her fork. This was the closest thing he'd seen to magic. A few months later, when they married, they would make a pact. To let the past drift away, to stop asking questions, to look forward to them from now on, never back. That spring, Marilyn was making plans for her senior year. James was finishing his PhD and waiting still to see if he would be taken on in the history department. There was an opening and he had applied and Professor Carlson, the department head, had hinted he was by far the most accomplished in his class. Now and then he would interview for positions elsewhere in New Haven and Providence, just in case. Deep inside though, he was certain he would be hired at Harvard. Carlson, as good as told me I'm in, he said to Marilyn whenever the subject came up. Marilyn nodded and kissed him and refused to think about what would happen when she graduated next year. When she headed off to medical school, who knew where? Harvard, she thought. Picking off her fingers, Columbia, Johns Hopkins, Stanford, each digit a step further away. Then in April, two things neither of them expected. Professor Carlson informed James he was very, very sorry to disappoint him, but they decided to take his classmate, William McPherson, instead. And of course, they knew James would find other opportunities elsewhere. Did they say why? Marilyn asked, and James replied, I just wasn't the right fit for the department, they said. And she did not raise the subject again. Four days later, an even bigger surprise, Marilyn was pregnant. So instead of Harvard, an officer, an offer from at last from humble Middlewood, Middlewood College accepted with relief. Instead of Boston, small town Ohio, instead of medical school, a wedding. Nothing quite as planned. A baby, Marilyn said to James over and over, our baby, so much better. And by the time they were married, Marilyn would only be three months along and it wouldn't show to herself, she said. You can come back and finish that last year when the baby is older. It would be almost eight years before school would seem a real possible and tangible again, but Marilyn didn't know that. As she left the dean's office, an indefinite leave secured, she was certain that everything she had dreamed for herself, medical school, doctorhood, the new important life, sat poised for her return, like a well-trained dog awaiting its master. Still, when Marilyn sat down at the tele telephone table in the dorm lobby and gave the long-distance operator her mother's number, her voice shook with each digit. As her mother's voice finally came on the line, she forgot to say hello. Instead, she blurted out, I'm getting married in June. Her mother paused. Who is he? His name is James Lee. Student? Marilyn's face warmed. He's just finishing his PhD in American history. She hesitated and decided on a half-truth. Harvard was thinking of hiring him in the fall. So he's a professor. A sudden alertness tinted her mother's voice. Sweetheart, I'm so happy for you. I can't wait to meet him. Relief flooded Marilyn. Her mother wasn't upset about her leaving school early. Why would she mind? She had done just what her mother had hoped. Met a wonderful Harvard man. She read off the information from a slip of paper. Friday, June 13th, 1130, with the Justice of Peach, Lance afterward at Parker House. It won't be a big party. Just us and you and a few of our friends. James's parents are both dead. Lee, her mother mused. Is he connected to anyone we know? Marilyn realized suddenly what her mother was imagining. It was 1958 in Virginia. In half the country, their wedding would break the law. Even in Boston, she sometimes saw disapproval in the eyes of the passerbys. Her hair was no longer the white blonde of her childhood, but it was still light enough to catch attention when bent toward James's inky black head. 
in the movie theater on a park bench at the counter at the Waldorf cafeteria, a gaggle of Radcliffe girls come down the stairs, one hovering nearby. To wait for the phone, the others crowding around the hall mirror to apply powder to their noses. One of them, just the week before, had heard about Marilyn's marriage and come to her room to see if it were really true. Marilyn squeezed the receiver and pressed the palm to her belly, kept her voice sweet. I don't know, mother. Why don't you ask him when you meet him? So her mother came in from Virginia, the first time she'd ever left the state. Standing at the station with James hours after his graduation, waiting for her mother's train, Marilyn told herself, she would have come anyway, even if I'd told her. Her mother stepped onto the platform and spotted Marilyn and the smile flashed across her face, spontaneous, proud, and for that instant, Marilyn believed it completely. Of course she would have. Then the smile flickered just for a moment, like a flash of static. Her gaze darted back and forth between the stout blonde woman standing on her daughter's left and the skinny oriental man on her right, looking for the advertised James, not finding him. Finally, understanding, a few seconds passed before she shook James's hands and told him she was very happy to meet him and allowed him to take her back. Marilyn and her mother had a dinner alone that night, and her mother did not mention James until dessert. She knew what her mother would ask, why do you love him? And steeled herself for the question. But her mother didn't ask him at all, ask her this at all. Didn't even mention the word love. Instead, she swallowed a bite of cake and studied her daughter from across the table. You're sure? She said that he doesn't just want a green card. Marilyn couldn't look at her and said she stared at her mother's hands, spotted despite the gloves and the lemon scented lotion at the fork pitched between their fingers at the crumb clinging in the tines. A tiny wrinkle creased her mouth, her mother's eyebrow as if someone had nicked her forehead with a knife. Years later, Hannah would spy the same mark and deep worry on her mother's face though she would not know its source. Then Marilyn would have admitted a resemblance. She was born in California, mother, she said, and her mother looked away and dabbed her mouth with her napkin, leaving two red smears on the linen. The morning of the wedding, as they waited in the courthouse, Marilyn's mother kept fiddling with the clasp of her purse. They'd gotten there almost an hour early, worried about traffic, about parking, about missing their spot which, with the justice of the peace. James had put on a new suit and kept patting the breast pocket, checking for the rings through the navy blue wool. Such a timid and nervous gesture made Marilyn want to kiss him right there in front of everyone. In 25 minutes, she would be his wife. And then her mother stepped closer to, and took Marilyn's elbow in a grip that felt like a clamp. Let's touch up your lipstick, she said, nudging Marilyn toward the ladies' room. She should have known it was coming. All morning, her mother had been dissatisfied with everything. Marilyn's dress wasn't white, but cream. It didn't look like a wedding dress. It was too plain, something like a nurse would wear. She didn't know why Marilyn wouldn't get married in a church. There were plenty nearby. She didn't like the weather in Boston. Why was it so gray in June? Daisies weren't a wedding flower. Why not roses instead? And why was she in such a hurry to get married now? Why not wait a while? It would have been easier if her mother had just used the slur. It would have been easier if she just insulted James outright. If she had said he was too short, too poor, not accomplished enough. But all her mother said over and over is, it's not right, Marilyn. It's not right. Leaving it unnamed and hanging in the air between them. Marilyn pretended not to hear her and took her lipstick from her purse. You'll change your mind, her mother said. You'll regret it later. Marilyn swiveled the tube and bent close to the mirror, and her mother grabbed her by both shoulders suddenly and desperately. The look in her eyes was fear, as if Marilyn were running along the edge of a cliff. Think about your children, she said. Where will you live? You won't fit in anywhere. You'll be sorry for the rest of your life. Stop it, Marilyn shouted, slamming her fist against the edge of the sink. This is my life, mother, mine. She jerked herself free and the lipstick went flying and then skittered to a stop on the tile floor. Somehow she'd made a large red streak on her mother's sleeve. Without a word, she pushed the door of the bathroom open, leaving her mother alone. Outside, James glanced anxiously at his wife-to-be. What's wrong, he murmured, leaning close. And she shook his head and whispered quietly, oh, my mother just thinks I should marry someone more like me. Then she took his lapel in her fists, pulled him close to hers and kissed him. Ridiculous, she thought, so obvious that she didn't even need to say it. Just days before, hundreds of miles away, another couple had married two, a white man and a black woman who would share the most appropriate name, Loving. In four months, they would be arrested in Virginia, 
the law reminding them that the almighty God had never intended black, white, yellow, and red to mix. There should be no mongrel citizens, no obliteration of racial pride. It would be four years before they protested and four years more before the court con concurred, but many more years before people around them would too. Some like Marilyn's mother never would. When Marilyn and James separated, her mother had returned from the ladies' room and stood silently watching them from a distance. She blotted her sleeve again and again in the roller towel, but the red mark still showed beneath the damp spot like an old blood stain. Marilyn wiped a smudge of lipstick from James's upper lip and grinned, and he patted his breast pocket again, checking the rings. To her mother, it looked as if James were congratulating himself. Afterwards, the writing reduced to a slide showed Marilyn's memory a thin white line like hair in the justice's bifocals, the knots of baby's breath in her bouquet, the fog of moisture in the wine glasses her old roommate Sandra had raised to toast. Under the table, James's hand in hers, the strange new band of gold cool against her skin, and across the table, her mother's carefully curled hair, her powdered face, her lips kept close to cover the crooked incisor, and that was the last time Marilyn saw her mother. Right, chapter two, the end, everything I ever told you. So what predictions can we make based on how Marilyn leaves things with her mother and how they're gonna address with their children that they are now um, a mixed race when it was just only months before even allowed uh, for people of different ethnicities to be married. Uh, the Loving case for the Supreme Court was a huge a uh, case that really made a huge difference in a lot of people's lives. And I actually kind of love it as one of my favorite Supreme Court cases. Do you have a favorite Supreme Court case? Is it just me that has a favorite Supreme Court case? I look forward to hearing your thoughts on chapter two of everything I never told you. Have a super day.